Every week, uh, we go th- we, uh, of late, we have been sort of going through uh, an element of our worship and asking uh, just before we start the sermon, why do we do certain things in our worship service? Uh, how should they be done? Is there biblical reasoning to them? And, and so far, we've asked, why do we gather on Sundays, which is the New Testament uh, Sabbath, if you will, the Lord's Day on Sundays, the resur- weekly resurrection day. We asked, why do we uh, read scripture to start out? Why do we sing? Uh, we asked last week, why do we select? the songs that we do sing, when we sing. We've asked uh, all sorts of these questions. Uh, We're going to get to to the giving of offering and expositional preaching and things like that in weeks to come. But today, a very very brief consideration is the question, why do we pray? And do we think deeply about how we pray when we pray? And the answer is yes. Uh, Every service we will start after the call to worship as we read God's word to us, calling us into his presence to give him praise. We then pray uh, up to God. His word came down to us. Our words go up to him in prayer. And, and we pray that he would bless the time, that he would open the word up to us, that he would, uh, his spirit would be amongst us and sanctifying us and saving those who don't believe. And then we pray before, uh, just after the singing as well. And then we pray before the sermon and we pray at the end of the sermon and sometimes additionally throughout. So we believe in praying because uh, from as early on as Even Solomon's temple dedication, back in the Old Testament, when Solomon had the temple built and then he prayed a prayer over it in dedication, he had on his lips, even those very early days, of God's place of assembly for worship. He called it a house of prayer. He called it constantly the place where God's people would come and call on him. And Jesus repeats that in his earthly ministry. When he comes to the temple, he, you know, he's thrown over the tables and getting rid of the the, the marketplace that had set up in the worship place because he said that it is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations and that was not occurring. So in Jesus' mindset, the, the gathering of God's people in a certain place at certain times could otherwise be called the gathering of prayer, the house of prayer. So we want to maintain that spirit and imbibe that that understanding of God's gathering always to speak of the church now, the New Testament temple, not the building, not the walls, but the gathering of God's people, wherever we do that regularly, we should have in our mind that it is the house of prayer. And so we pray regularly and we pray often. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after Pentecost has occurred and the the saints have been uh, uh, gathered after being swept into the kingdom by the thousands, they then devoted themselves to some things. And Acts 2, 42 tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, that's the sacraments, and the prayers. They devoted themselves to the prayers. Now, this was probably some cycle of, of, at that point, very Jewish themed prayers or prayers that the Jews had gotten used to praying. Uh, uh, but, but we take that also over as, as what a healthy church does in community as we assemble is we devote ourselves to the prayers. Reformed tradition has sort of picked up on this and said that there's, uh, and you can read all sorts of old, older style liturgies that are still uh, extant and working out today in different denominations. We don't work on a, on, a, uh, uh, on a set sort of concrete call and response, pastors reading things and you reading things off the screen. We don't work with a liturgy like that. We work with a bit more of a, uh, of a, of a skeleton liturgy of regular things done every week. But our prayers, we allow to be spirit-filled and uh, extemporaneous in the sense that we, we aren't reading something. We're praying in the moment over thoughts and topics and things that we have considered beforehand. So I'm not just getting up and off the, you know, just shooting from the hip and praying whatever comes to mind. Those, the deacons and the elders and other trusted men who pray during the service will have been asked to think about what they're praying for, think ahead of the needs of the church, consider of the sermon and the topic of the worship that day. So it's praying, consider, uh, considering what to pray for beforehand, but not reading prayers. Nonetheless, I, I think what is helpful is that the Reformed tradition has sort of uh, taken up from some of the early church fathers and named a few particular prayers that are good for the corporate gathered people of God. And they are the prayers of adoration, basically praise God, how amazing you are. 
Our prayers of confession, when we name our sins and we acknowledge that we're not worthy of God and can only gather by His grace. The prayers of thanksgiving, where we thank Him for all that He's done and all that He's given. And prayers of supplication, where we're asking for things and interceding for other people in our nation. And of course, also the prayer of illumination. Basically, the prayer to say, God, illuminate the word to us this morning. Open up the word of God this evening as we gather. Now, I listed those. And even though we're not a, not a uh, historically uh, identical reformed church in the sense that we have this set liturgy and different parts of our, of our uh, day is, okay, now let's do prayer of confession. Now let's do prayer of adoration. But you will still hear those themes through all of the prayers that the deacons and the elders offer. Prayers of adoration, confession of sin, thanksgiving to God, supplication, and of course, illumination. So that's what we are doing when we pray. We're doing those things that we see to be very biblical and also very historical. And so what you must be doing when, when we're gathered together, there may only be one person speaking the prayer, but of course, in your own heart, you need to be engaging into those words, leaning into the words as if uh, you, they are praying over you and for you because we are. And so you amen them in your heart, of course, amen them heartily, which uh, I, I'm thinking we might do a whole, whole section on how we worship about why we say amen and do it loudly. We, we might do that, but, but amen loudly together. And of course, hallelujah and amen in your heart and in your own voice as we go. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. So that is what we devote ourselves to. In light of that, we're going to pray now a prayer of thanksgiving and illumination that God would open his word up and shine his spiritual light on it so that we might understand it. Let's pray. Father God, Ecclesiastes tells us that we are on earth, you are in heaven, therefore let our words be few. We know that you are a father that loves to hear our prayers as your gathered, assembled people in your name. And yet we know that piling up words and using impressive wordings upon each other and, 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 and repeating even uh, well-versed and well-written prayers, that, that is not what you desire. You desire that we come and in faith and in childlike simplicity, we call to you as Father to fulfill those things that you have written in your word. Well, God, we do that this morning. Would you please enable us to understand our duties in prayer? Would you please enable us to be a, a house of prayer that, that heartily amen with, with pure consciences and with, with clean lives and hands and hearts, we bring our prayers to you this morning. And we have prayed for, for the lost in our midst that they would be saved. We have prayed that you receive glory. Lord God, at this juncture, we pray that you, would, uh, uh, that you would illumine the word for us, that you would enable those who do not have faith to, for the first time, have the spark of faith in their souls that they would understand the gospel. And for those of us who know the gospel, would you please clarify it? Would you please empower the understanding of it in our minds so that we are all the more trusting your goodness for us in Jesus? And for those of us who are, who are laboring and who are working and who are, who are striving onwards in maturity, would you please give us bread today? Give us daily bread that would nourish our souls so that we might be strengthened all the more to serve you, our Lord and King and God and friend the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray in your name to our Father by the Spirit. And everybody said...